Ugh, excuse me, sorry. You guys ever have a weirdly strong connection with a piece of media that's at best okay? L like, I'm not talking mediocre or so bad it's good. I mean something so inconsequentially average that most people won't think twice about it. But for some reason, you do. Whether it be a movie, album, video game, it's got a draw despite being so middle of the road. A, a decent 6 out of 10 if you would. There's a bunch of reasons for this, the most obvious being nostalgia, which there's there's nothing inherently wrong with. I know that word has a bad stigma nowadays, and wh while some of that is true, talking about how nostalgia is bad is like beating a dead horse at this point. As long as you're being objective with the stuff you like, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being nostalgic. And while it definitely plays into what I'm talking about, I feel it's like nostalgia inverted, where something hooked you and made you look for stuff that was similar to it. Like if it was music, looking for similar sounding bands, or, or a movie and finding one of the same genre or by the same director. But then experiencing those things and realizing, wow, the original thing that got me into this kind of niche subgenre or whatever, blows ass. It's kind of just underwhelming now that you've experienced more of what this field has to offer. That's why I consider this nostalgia inverted, where instead of seeing the original subject as the pinnacle of art and creativity and crap, you're just kind of like, eh, it's, it's not that good no more. But you still gotta give it credit, because without it, you wouldn't have discovered a lot of the things you're into now. To use myself as an example, I'm a big fan of Weezer, which I know isn't something I should say out loud. But my introduction to them wasn't through Blue Album or Pinkerton, it was Make Believe. For anyone who's not in the know, this is a super contentious album, with a lot of fans considering it to be one of the worst things the band has ever released, which is kind of saying something for Weezer. Me, on the other hand, when I first heard this album, I thought it kicked ass. In fact, I still know almost all the words to each song, and can even play some of them on guitar. But nowadays, while it's nowhere near my favorite, I still gotta give it credit for introducing me to the band. Without Make Believe, I probably would have never listened to their other albums that are leagues better, or even discovered a lot of bands I listen to today. So even though this album really isn't that good, it still did a lot for me in the long run. Also, Perfect Situation is like top 5 Weezer songs, I'll fight anyone over that. But that's the main point I want to drive home. We all have our own 6 out of 10s in one shape or form. You know, they may not be the most polished or thought out, but they stuck with us. And today, I wanted to talk about one particular 6 out of 10 that's affected me like no other. That being a little game called A Story About My Uncle. Released in 2014 by Gone North Games, A Story About My Uncle is a game I have an unnecessary amount of history with. For anyone who's been watching my channel for a while, this is the third video I've made about this game. The first one being archived on my second channel, and the second one sadly being lost to the sands of time. I, I promise it existed, because why would I lie about that? I bring this up because just like with Make Believe, I thought this was a masterpiece the first time I played it. So many elements just clicked in my dumb little teenage brain that I, I just couldn't put it down. And to give it credit, it does have a lot of cool things going for it. A story about my uncle is centered around a protagonist trying to find his, if the name wasn't a dead giveaway, uncle in a distant world after being sent there by one of his inventions. Along the journey, you'll explore multiple different locales with your main method of transportation being a grapple device that lets you cling on to almost anything. I remember this is what hooked me the most about the game, which, if you're curious on how I learned about it, it was after uh, seeing up, it in guys? a bunch of Welcome old Leafy is Here videos. videos. Yeah, I know. I was an edgy 14-year-old like with unlimited to access to the videos. internet. Anyways, I can't undo the past, I can only learn from it. Nights. But being able to swing around like Spider-Man in these lush open worlds looked like the coolest thing ever. We'll come back to the grapple later, because now I want to focus on the story, because it's in the title for heaven's sake. The game the is told through a narrator recollecting events as you experience them in real time. From locations you explore to the characters you meet, it's actually pretty captivating despite some less than stellar voice acting. We hadn't seen any people around yet, but ahead of us lay... T -t -t Today, Junior! This is what I consider to be the game's strongest element telling a captivating story through its environments. Not only do you learn more about the characters and world through progression, you can also find hidden set pieces at each level that gives more insight to your surroundings. This is a great way to reward the player for exploring. Since the game is already centered around telling a narrative through its set pieces, it makes sense to be rewarded for doing the thing the game wants you to do. In fact, the levels themselves are beautiful and each invoke distinct feelings and atmosphere. The Sanctuary is an eerie jungle environment that acts as a great introduction to the game's world and mechanics. 
The village is a warm but desolate section that progressively gets more ominous the deeper you explore. Here's where you'll also meet the creatures that inhabit this world and learn, despite how good the environments look, the characters don't. <laughs> like, like, at all. The Chasms is a dark and unsettling cave system that ends with the only boss or enemy encounter in the game. Too bad it kinda sucks. Oh! Starhaven is this badass utopia that's so open and freeing, especially when juxtaposed against all the other levels being set in caves. But similar to the village, the farther you go, the more ominous it becomes, with these frozen mountains looming in the background of the entire level. And finally, the ice caves are a cold and barren wasteland, acting as the climax of the adventure. Your character's abilities are also intertwined with the levels, with most giving something new like more grapples or the rocket boots later on. And some even hinder your abilities, like the ice cave, where not only is your grapple ineffective on icy surfaces, but your rocket boots break halfway through. It's never like, oh, you need to collect a certain amount of whatever to unlock an ability or level up to get this, th this thingy. It keeps the immersion intact and complements the narrative even more. Another part of the storytelling I want to discuss is a character you meet early in the adventure, Maddie. She's one of the frog people that seems a little more cognizant than the rest. Look at these kids. Nice kid. What the fuck? Nice kids. How about you look at them for once? In a way, she acts like a surrogate for the world at large and how they admire Fred. But in the village's case, they see him more as a godly figure, as shown by the shrines they built in his honor. However, in Maddie's case, she sees him more as a father figure, which acts as a reflection to the main character too. The game states both don't have fathers of their own and consider Fred to fill that role. Maddie seemed to be especially fond of him, taking after all that he did. Maybe Fred was like a father to her. She didn't have a real father, right? If she was born from an egg. That's right. That's another thing we had in common. This could be seen with both of them following in his footsteps, accompanying him at adventures, and becoming uneasy and kind of lost when he isn't around. Quick spoilers for an almost decade old game. Ugh. Fred kind of reciprocates that dynamic with Maddie when you find him at the end. Madeline. My little Maddie. I, I should have taken her to see Starhaven long ago. She was always so curious about the strays. This goes a long way with immersing the player in the story. While a story about my uncle is the deepest narrative, the way it utilizes subtlety adds so many layers to things you otherwise wouldn't think twice about. I could go on about how much I love the game's storytelling or, or some of the cute little details sprinkled throughout the stages, but, but I think you get the idea. And then what, it, Olaf is just in this game. <laughs> I don't know why. So that begs the question, what makes a story about my uncle a 6 out of 10? Well, it all has to do with the same thing that hooked me in the first place. The grapple. Like I said earlier, this is your main method of transportation, and to the game's credit, you're able to latch on to anything to your heart's content. The only issue is that the game is really fucking linear. About 90% of it is just you swinging on the same three copy-paste floating rocks and sometimes holding on to one as it levitates around. They barely scratch the surface with what the grapple can do. And I know this was most likely done in service of the story and to emphasize specific landmarks, but I have counterpoints to this. One. Don't you think you'd have more appreciation and understanding of a level if you were able to swing around all willy-nilly and explore to your heart's content? Sure, it may not be as kinetic, but this would allow the player to experiment, try new techniques, understand their surroundings, and push the limits of what they're capable of doing. And two, this mechanic is genius and it's squandered by how little options you have to finish a stage. It sucks too, because each level introduces a cool idea for the grapple that could have been fleshed out into bigger sections, or even levels themselves. The sanctuary has these cool floating platforms early on that you need to time your jumps with. The village is pretty open during the first half and lets you explore freely. The chasms has the worm boss, Starhaven lets you ride on zeppelins carrying cargo, and the ice caves has this cool part where these huge blocks are falling from the ceiling, and you need to make it across a chasm without dying. 
Granted, some of these parts are literally bleak and you'll miss the moments. In fact, you could straight up skip the block part with a carefully aimed grapple, but the fact they left such an impression despite how quickly they're dropped proves how much more this game could have been. And it's not even a situation where they drop one idea and immediately go to the next without fleshing out like, like, like Sonic Lost World. It's literally just one or two cool ideas that are instantly dropped and it's right back to the linear stuff. But you know what makes this really sting? It's the fact there's one specific part of Star Haven where the game opens up way more, it gives you so many ways to reach the goal. It's pretty late in the level, it only lasts for like 30 seconds, but there are so many different islands and rocks to grapple onto, it's crazy. I swear to god, there's more freedom in this one little section than there is in the entire game. Also, I like these birds. They're not even modeled, they're just literally flat gifts. It's so funny. This would have helped tremendously with replayability, because even though the storytelling and environments are great, revisiting the same narrative can only do so much on repeated playthroughs when there aren't alternative endings or time-sensitive events. It's the same thing every time, and honestly, I don't think a lot of people will cling to the story like I did, as I'm kind of a sucker for environmental storytelling. Meanwhile, if the gameplay was more open-ended and let you find unique ways to reach whatever, that would be awesome. You could find fast routes, scenic routes, stupid routes, anything. Now, this might be asking too much of an indie studio, but if you're gonna have this cool of an idea, then run with it. Make it as fleshed out as possible, so when people see your game, they'll think, holy shit, I gotta play this. This open-ended design also would have helped kind of resolve another one of the game's problems. It's too short. Yikes. Not counting the intro and epilogue, there are only five levels in total. And I know I was singing their praises earlier, but it doesn't help that he could beat the game in under an hour. There could have easily been another level or two, and honestly, it feels like the game thought so as well. So you get to the end of the ice cave, right? And what did you know it? There's your uncle. And after giving you a whole spiel about the frog people and his research, he's like, oh, hey. Okay, bye. Meanwhile, you two are standing right above this badass looking hole with all these crystals trailing out of it. Now, putting aside my thoughts of the game benefiting from another level or two, this ending also feels abrupt narratively. You spend the game chasing after your uncle and learning about the relationship you two have, so when you finally get to him, he just throws you out without a second thought. I don't want to be the, oh, here's how I would have designed it guy when I know jack shit about game design, but I think there could have been more time spent with him, especially since he chooses to stay with the frog people. And to be fair, I like that he makes this decision as it's thematically appropriate with everything we've seen, but he should have needed more convincing before choosing to leave his family, friends, research, everything in the human world for these damn frogs. I think you get the idea. A story about my uncle is a game with some cool ideas, but a devastating amount of missed potential. From its length, structure, to the use of its main mechanic, it leaves a lot to be desired. However, just like with the make-believe example from earlier, it left an impact and made me seek out games with similar mechanics or storytelling. Stuff like Refunct, Cloud Built, Valley, Windlands. I feel all of these games build off of something from a story about my uncle to a degree I wanted the game to do. Whether it being more non-linear or longer or fleshing out its mechanics or whatever. And I want to be as fair as possible when comparing a story about my uncle to other games, because, after all, it's an indie game made by a handful of people with a tight budget. Like, it wouldn't be fair to compare it to a triple A title, even though it's far more structurally sound than a lot of shit these days. But I think it's reasonable to look at other games with similar mechanics and team sizes. Not saying the game's status as an indie title exonerates it from criticism, but it's something to keep in mind, especially when the games I listed before do fix a lot of those issues. But even though I may prefer all these games to a Sabu, as, as the kids call it, I gotta give it credit for getting me into this kinda knee subgenre thing. So despite all of its problems, this game is still a decent 6 out of 10 that changed my life in an incredibly small but positive way. If any of you have your own decent 6 out of 10s, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. Whether it's a book, movie, game, album, whatever you describe as barely decent at best, but has stuck with you for some reason. Also, if anyone's interested, I'd link the game's Steam page in the description. Don't let anything I said deter you from checking it out if it looks interesting. What I thought might have been lacking in one department, another might enjoy to a much greater extent, and that's perfectly fine. Just because something's a 6 out of 10 in one person's eyes doesn't mean it'll be the same in another's. For all I know, this could be a lot of people's favorite of all time, or, or hell, there are probably folks out there who think Make Believe is Weezer's best album. 
I, I mean, there aren't, but it's fun to pretend there are. Either way, like what you like, don't like what you don't like, but just be respectful. Because in reality, if you make fun of someone for liking something you don't, you're a goddamn loser. That kind of relates to what I was saying, but it's also just good life advice. Alright, I'm sick. I'm gonna go now. Bye!